Good morning. It's good to see a lot of visitors with us today. Um, I know we have um, a lot of folks uh, on vacation and a lot of other things that are going on. And, you know, school will be starting back, you know, before you know it. It seems like they just let out. It'll be uh, just a few short weeks and kids will be back in school. I know those of you that are educators are looking forward to that, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> it doesn't seem like the break is ever long enough, but, you know, God bless you for what you do. Uh, uh, our daughter, Kenzie, is going to be teaching for the first time, too, so we're excited about it. We're excited about many things, most especially paychecks uh, that she'll be receiving. Um, I, I uh, as we continue this study in 1 Corinthians, I... Um, Always, as I, as I say many times, I was talking to Kim uh, yesterday, uh, how challenging it is for your, your pastor to, uh, to teach through a book in the Bible because sometimes there's just things that are just more difficult to teach than others. And uh, even as, as we go through it sometimes to find uh, the relevance of some things that uh, are important for us today to uh, understand and, and learn from. You know, next Sunday is going to be probably an interesting uh, a lesson, you know, as we, as we begin to study that in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 11, verses 1 through 16, or 2 through 16, really, is what we'll be looking at. You know, there's a couple of passages in there that's going to be real exciting for, for me to teach. And uh, uh, the verse, chapter 11, verse 6, it says, If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved, she should cover her head. And uh, verses 8 and 9 says, For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So I'm really looking forward to preaching on that, okay? Uh, and where's Jamie Jones at? Is he in here? I may get him to do that next Sunday. Wouldn't it be good, Scarlett? We can give him a shot at that. Um, anyway, uh, it, it's going to be exciting. We're not there yet, so we're going to look at what we have today. As we look at the last three chapters, chapters 8, 9, and 10, you know, we've been, we've been dealing with, with Christian freedoms. Christian freedoms, you know, uh, and, and, and what they are, what they mean, and, and how they should be expressed, you know, by the believers. Um, you know, there, there are always those areas in our lives that we just want answers to. You know, we just want answers to, but, but as we study the Bible, they, we find that there's not a real specific direction as far as what it is that we should do or shouldn't do in any particular situation that we may be in life. And life would be so much easier if this Bible would contain all those do's and don'ts all those things that we run into a problem, I can just flip over to, to, to book such and such, to chapter so and so, and there's my answer to that. You know, and, and it's not that way. It's just simply not that way. And, and so as we study the Bible, we understand the purpose and the mind of God. And not, not that we know the mind of God, but we begin to understand the purpose and the mind of God so that we can make rational decisions regarding the things in our lives, and most especially the things that deal with our liberties and our freedoms as Christians. You know, we know that we have certain liberties, but we have to be careful with our liberties. We have to be careful with the freedoms that we have, not to flaunt them in front of non-believers, you know, or even before less mature believers so that we may cause someone to stumble. So the things that we do, the decisions that we make, are not based on what it is that we feel like may be necessarily right or wrong, but whether or not it would cause someone else, maybe in, in weaker in their faith or does not believe at all, to stumble in some way. So... There's a lot for us to think about as Christians. We have a lot to consider, you know, as we walk through this world and do the things that we do. Last week's message, we saw that Paul was giving, you know, a lot of examples about how the Jews stumbled and sinned, you know, and, and when they followed Moses through the desert and, and, and even, you know, how the Lord destroyed them because of the sin. You know, we look at that and we say, man, God's just kind of harsh on this sin thing. I mean, he's, he must be really serious when he says, you shouldn't do this, and we do it anyway. You know, and, and because we, we're of the age now that we think, well, God's a forgiving and a loving God, and he just kind of overlooks some of these things because he knows we're weak. But as we read what we read last week, you know, the Lord is serious about being holy. If you belong to him, listen to me, friends, if you belong to him, his expectation of you is to be holy. And uh, in chapter 10, verse 11 and 12, Paul gives this instruction. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 
don't know how many times I have fallen thinking that I was in good shape, standing sturdy, and had everything under control. That is usually the times when I always fall. So in verses 1 through 13, we see Paul makes it clear, makes it clear that idolatry, immorality, and complaining against God is not just wrong, it's a sin. These things are not just wrong, they're a sin. And Christians have no liberty in regard to these particular things. Verses 14 through 22, we're going to look today, he says that we, we will see that the apostle explains why the sin of idolatry is especially abominable to God. It, it's not a moral issue to eat something offered to an idol, but it is a serious sin to engage in any form of idol worship. I, we, we look at this and we say, this stuff doesn't pertain to me. Steve, why don't you just skip a couple of chapters and get on to the good stuff? I mean, there's going to be some stuff in there about speaking in tongues and prophesying and all this stuff. Man, I, want to, I want to hear some of that. This is very important to us today, most especially in this age that we live in today. We're free to attend these pagan functions and stuff is what Paul was saying, but we're not free to participate in this type of false worship. In verses 14 and 15, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. What does the word flee mean? Go away. Run, Forrest, run. Get away from it. Whatever it takes to get away from what it is going on, get away from that. You know, you can, you can run away from something, and then you can go back and look at it and analyze it. You don't have to stand there in the middle of it, analyze it, figure it out, have a prayer meeting about it, and then make a decision. Get away from it. Look at it from over your shoulder and make a decision then as far as whether or not you need to be in that particular place or not. Therefore, my dear brothers, dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to you, to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. That's the title of the message today. I speak to sensible people. Are you sensible people? Paul was their former pastor, and he loved them very much, and he hadn't forgotten about them. He hadn't just, he hadn't just moved on to bigger and better things. He loved those people in Corinth. I, I'm, I talk to pastors all the time that were, that were your pastors here at Albertson. There, there's been many that I speak to from time to time, and they always ask about you. They always ask how you're doing, how you're feeling, how's, how's so-and-so doing. They, they, they concern, they love you. They care about you. Paul felt the same way. He, concerned about the, he was concerned about the church in Corinth. Just because he wasn't around didn't mean he had forgotten about them. And there's no doubt about it because of all the instruction that he's given them, most especially in this first letter. Now, he, he now speaks to them as, as he would talk to sensible people, people that have the capability to understand and to grasp the meaning of something. He, he's saying, reason this out, guys. Reason it out. You got the info. You got the, you got the knowledge. You got the ability. Think about it. Think about it. You don't come here every Sunday, open the top of your head, and let Steve dump a bunch of stuff in there, shut it back off, and go away. That's not what you do. You think about it. You consider it. You work over it. You, 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 you've got to, you, need to, you, need to real, you need to reason what it is that you hear me talk about. You need to find out whether or not I'm telling you the truth. Don't just take my word for it. Be like the Bereans. Be like the, in, in Acts chapter 17, 11, it said, Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Test it for yourself. It's important. Because there's too many times that people in churches, there's, there's just churches all over America today with a lot of zombies in it, and, and they're told something to go away. I don't know how many times I've heard someone come up to me and say, some in such and such belief that they may have for whatever it is or some idea. And I said, well, where'd, you, where'd, you, where'd you read that at? I said, what's my pastor said? I said, well, where did, he, where did he find that at? Well, I don't know. I said, well, show me in the Bible what it says. Well, I don't know, but my pastor said it. You need to look it up. You need to study it. Be sensible, all of a sudden. You don't need a list of do's and don'ts in order to know what you... You don't need a list of do's and don'ts in order to, order to know what the Lord's will is in your life. You don't, you don't need that. Examine it. Reason with it. Judge it for yourself. And I, I say this so you don't think of, to yourselves that you're not idol worshipers. 
I, I, know, I don't know, I don't know because I've not been in everybody's yard, but not anybody's yard that I've been in so far here at Alberson had a statue in the backyard, you know, that you had some shrine set up or some altar before and that you brought, you brought sacrifices out to a regular. But anybody got one? Oh, please don't tell me. <clears throat> so, when, so, when, so, when, so when we think about that, they think, well, I'm not an idol worshiper because I don't have some statue in the yard where I'm going to pray to. Well, I'm going to tell you, friends, there's a lot of idols that we have in this world today that doesn't look like a statue. A lot of things that are. A lot of things in this century, most especially. Exodus 20, verse 3 says, You shall have no other gods before me. That's not a suggestion. Those are not part of, actually, again, part of the ten suggestions, okay? They are the ten commandments. These are the things that we are to obey and listen to. So what are idols that we worship today? What, 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 do, you place, what do you place before your time that you spend with the Lord? What is it that you put ahead of God? It's anything, it's an idol because it's something that you worship. It is something that you, when you place something in more valuable, in more value than you do the Lord, it is something that you're worshiping. You know, there are people that have jobs and careers that just consume much of their time. You know, there's, they're, they're, and it's because, it's because people worship stuff. They worship things, you know. Romans 1 talks about how, how, how man uh, made things that look like animals and, 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 and things and, and, and worship those things. I, it's amazing how we, we call our football teams, you know, stuff like the Panthers, you know, or, or the cars that we drive, you know, you know like a Firebird. These are, these are not an animal, really, but we, we give them animal names in such a way so that we can, we can really worship them. Care, I mean, I see people wa wash and wax their cars so much that the paint's almost off of it. If they'd spend a fraction of that time in their Bible washing and waxing on this thing a little bit, can you imagine how it would change their life? Because that firebird's not going to do anything for you, but probably get you a ticket. That's another subject, and I've been talking about that quite a bit lately. <laughs> we, uh, we work a lot of times so we can have more things, bigger houses. Nicer cars, prettier clothes, neater gadgets. How many of you got smartphones? How many of you got smartphones and as soon as a new one comes out, you're standing at USA or Verizon or wherever you get that next one? It's important to have those things. How many hours a week do you spend watching TV, friends? How many hours a week do you spend reading your Bible? It's almost embarrassing when we begin to compare it in that way, isn't it? Matthew 6, 21, 24 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If, if therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Everybody worships, friends. Even atheists worship. They worship themselves. When men reject God, they worship false gods. When men reject God, they worship false gods. Job put it this way in Job 31, 24, and 28. It says, Have I put my trust in money or felt secure because of my gold? Have I gloated about my wealth and all that I own? Have I, have I looked at the sun shining in the skies or the moon walking down its silver pathway and been secretly enticed in my heart to throw kisses at them and worship? If so, I should be punished by the judges if it would mean I denied the God of heaven. No idol can help man. No idol can save. No idol can forgive. No idol can give you peace in this life. It can't solve your problems, no, nor money, nor fame, nor education, nor social prestige, or any other thing that puts anything before God. Every idol is man-made and is helpless, and anything that you place before God is an idol in this life. And since it is of no value, Paul says the only thing that is good for is to run away from. Run away. Flee. Verses 6 through 18. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks and participation in the blood of Christ. And is not the bread that we break a participation 
in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we, who are many, are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? In a couple of weeks, I'm going to preach on this message, and it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an outstanding message. And if, if, if you've got no other time of the year that you want to come to hear a message, you come in two weeks, and I, I'm hoping it'll be two weeks. I don't know if it's going to interfere with the Bible school stuff and all, but I, I'll talk with them. But in, in 1 Corinthians 11, 17, 34, we're going to understand what communion is about, okay? So if you ever, had a, you ever wanted to know what communion was about, if you want to know what the Lord's table represented, you come that week, and you'll find out. So I, I'm not going to deal with it so much uh, on this subject right now because I am going to preach on this. So, so, um, but I, I want us to just look at a couple things. All Christians all over the world are united in this breaking of this one bread and drinking of this one juice or wine. We who are many are one body. Isn't that amazing when you think about it that all the believers around the world, we're all united in the same way through that process because we are all one with Christ we are one with each other and as we become in the, in the fellowship with Jesus we come into fellowship with each other every one of us it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't make any difference who you are it doesn't matter if you're rich it doesn't matter if you're poor it doesn't matter if you're black it doesn't matter if you're white it doesn't matter about your educational status it doesn't matter about your families we all stand equal and together at the foot of the cross all of us forgiven sinners amen This is one of the great problems of life as, as it was in Corinth many years ago. We, we are to deal with this on the basis of who we basically are. And that is why the apostle, he begins with the table of the Lord because it is the central act of Christian worship. You, you know, and I say this, friends, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I don't want to talk too much about it, but I think just sometimes we just take this time at the Lord's table as just another thing to do. I put it off a few weeks because I want us to understand something about it. It will be special to us from this day forward. What do we do when we celebrate the Lord's table, when we, when we pass the cup and we break the bread together? Well, well according to this scripture and, and, and so many others, we are reminding ourselves that everyone else and everybody that sees us, that we, that we are basically the same, that we're saying that we died with Christ. This old nature, this old sinfulness within us, died with him when Christ shed his blood something died within us all as well and that something was the old self-centered life that, that wanted to be the center of attention and for everyone to see us we, res we resigned our commission as Lord of the universe ourselves I'm saying when we died with Christ and that's what it means. When we, when we pass the bread and we take and eat of it together, we're saying that we found a new source. We found a new source of strength. Not within ourselves, but within the body of Christ. We have found it. We no longer live by self-esteem, but by the approval of God, the righteousness granted and gifted to us by God. We feed on that. We rest on that. We feed on the truth that God unfolds in his word. Feed on the strength that Christ himself gives us to love even the, the unlovely. We draw on it. We eat it. We take it in moment by moment, day by day. And that's, and that's what we are. That's what we are, believers. That's what we are. We all possess the same life, and that means that we are one body, united in one family. And that's what the Lord's table means. And I said I wasn't going to talk much about it, didn't I? Okay, well, you're in store for a lot then, if, if that's a short version. Consider the people of Israel, do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar. And when the Israelites sacrificed to the Lord, you know, some of the offerings were burnt, some of the offerings were offered to the priests to eat, some of the offerings were given to those that gave the offering. They all participated in the offering itself, and that's what it is. That's what we do together. Each one of us is involved. And when we become involved with, with other religious ceremonies, that are not consistent in the worship of the Lord as we know to be true, then we have also become part of that sacrifice and that participation. Are you listening to me? Just as we participate in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine at the Lord's table. So, 
verses 19 through 22. Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? The food that's sacrificed to the idol is nothing and the idol is nothing. Okay? Everybody with me on that? I think we dealt with this a few chapters ago. The food sacrificed to idols is nothing and the idol itself is nothing. Because there's nothing that it was ever sacrificed to other than a little statue. There was nothing there. But the idol represents that which is demonic. And this is what Paul was saying. And, and, and do, do you see the reason that we have to flee from these things? Because they can, they can be demonic. And, and, and you may say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian, Steve. I can't be influenced by demons. Well, you need to go back and read Ephesians chapter 6. When worshipers believe an idol represents an actual God. Now, there's people that do. Now, we'll, we'll just talk about the idols right now. When worshipers believe that they represent an actual God, Satan, need, he'll, he'll send one of his demonic emissaries, you know, and, and, and he'll act there in that imaginary God in some kind of way. You know, there, there's, there's no God behind it, but there's a demonic force that could be behind it. Demons can exhibit considerable power. They're not all powerful, but they have considerable power. Look at astrology. You look at astrology. You say, but that's not a God. Oh, really? You, you got people that, I don't know how many millions of people in America that, that, that look at the newspaper to see what their fortune is for this coming week or the next day or whatever. They're, they're interested in what their sign is. I'm a Virgo. What does that mean? I don't know. But, I mean, there's people that are interested in all those things. They'll go see these, these seers and these prophetesses and, and whatever they may call themselves, and they'll look at their hands and look at the little lines in them, and, and they'll tell you all the things that are going to happen by looking at that. I got a scar here, too. wonder what they see in that one. They'll take some cards and they'll roll them out in there. They'll see something that's in the stars. And, and something will happen that, that this gullible person that hears this will say, man, it's true because it happened in my life. And they make it a god. They make it an idol. Second Thessalonians 2, 9 and 11 says, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles. Signs and wonders and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. You hearing me? They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be commended or condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Verse 21, chapter 10. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Paul's not giving advice here. He's just stating a fact. He's not just saying this is what you should or shouldn't do. He's saying you cannot do this. Jesus made it clear you can't have two masters. He didn't say it's not a good idea that you have two masters. He said you cannot do it. If you have two, you're going to love one and you're going to hate the other one. When we fellowship with the Lord, we cannot fellowship with the devil. James chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, it says, With the tongue, and I'm talking about things we say now, but, but with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. You know, it, it breaks my heart. I, I, I have people that come around me sometimes that will talk worse than anyone I ever heard in the four years I spent in the army. And the next thing I see on Facebook, they're praising God for something that happened in their life. What a foolish thing to do. You can't have it both ways. Not just in our speaking, but in our worship. You cannot worship. Listen, you can't go down and worship in the Unitarian Church down the road on Sunday and come back here and worship and all of a sudden think everything's the same. 
Now, y'all might offend some people saying that, but I'm telling you like it is. You need to know these things. You don't need to be foolish and unwise about these things. You can't participate in false teachings and, 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 and in true teachings and, 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 and believe that you can do both things and it'd be all right. You can't share in the communion with the devil and share in the communion with the Lord. Christians are not immune from the influences of demons, friends. When we willingly ignore the Lord's way and we flirt with the things of Satan, we open ourselves to a demonic influence. In 2 John 10 and 11, 2 John 10 and 11, it says, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. Now, when you welcome some that come to you door to door, whether they're Jehovah Witnesses or these young good Mormon friends of ours, and they try to promote their beliefs, you need to send them away. You don't need to be rude. You don't need to be ugly. You don't need to be sarcastic. You just need to send them away. Do you hear me? When we do this, when we are rude and ugly and sarcastic, most especially when we brag about it, as I hear some people do, we just make their case even stronger what it is that they're teaching. Do not welcome them. Because when we do this, we participate with the demonic influence within the true teachings of the Bible. This is how the devil works, friends. Don't, don't be deceived. He uses, the, he uses the small things to work his way in. He, he uses your belief in God and other people's belief in God to work himself into your life so you'll begin to question things that you know are not right. And you won't know that they're not right unless you spend some time in this. I'm going to read the remainder of this chapter. Everything is permissible, beginning at verse 23. But not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go eat whatever's put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered to sacrifice, then do not eat it. Both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake. The other man's conscience, I mean, not yours. For why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I think I so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Amen. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greek, nor the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Everything that is spoken in this text leads up to this verse 31. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. We've used that verse many times. Everything that you say should glorify God. Everything you do should glorify God. Everything that you, every place that you go should glorify God. Everything that you think should bring glory to God. Everything, not most things, not just the things that occur on Sunday. Everything, every time, everywhere you are. For our actions around other believers and most especially unbelievers, should, by the simple act of our response to everything, people should see how God would respond to everything. When Paul uses this phrase that the Corinthian church had adopted, he's, he's, and, 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 this is, and, and this is when he said all things are permissible, is what he's talking about. He uses this phrase that the Corinthian church had adopted. He's, he's talking about all things that are not specifically prohibited in the Scriptures. There's things in the Scriptures that are prohibited. I talked to you at the very beginning. There's a lot of things that we just simply have to work out. We have to be sensible. We have to reason with it. We have to understand God's will in it. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is constructive. That's a good translation, I think, in the NIV. Your Bible may say edify, which is a great word also. But edify basically means to build a house. That's what it means, to build a house. And, and, and that's what's being done when we edify the Lord. We're building a house. We're construction workers. We're building upon something. There's four basic things that bring edification to the Lord. The first thing that brings edification is the Word. Is the Word. 
Paul spoke to the elders in the church of Ephesus when they came to see him off before he went to Rome in Acts chapter 20, verse 32. It says, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sacrificed. The next thing that, that brings edification or building up is preaching and teaching. And we're going to see that more when we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when we talk about the spiritual gifts. And, 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 and Paul's talking about that I would rather you th that you preach and you prophesy rather than those that are just more interested in speaking in tongues which edifies yourself. The things that we should do is to edify the body, to build up the body. Love, love, we, we see that in 1 Corinthians in, in 8.1. It says knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, edifies. And the fourth thing is obedience and service. In Ephesians 4.12 it says the saints and the work of the service to the building up of the body of Christ. These are the things that are important in edification and the building up. So even if something is permissible, does it bring glory to God? Is it constructive? Is it profitable? Those are the things that you need to ask. Not what I can get away with, but what does it do to bring glory to God? That's the question you should be asking. If it's not, then why in the world would you want to do it anyway? Why would you even care about it? Why would you want to have anything to do with it? In your mind, if you know that it doesn't bring glory to God, why do it? Leave it alone. Run away from it. Verse 24, nobody should seek his own good but the good of others. What, what have you given up this week that, that helps somebody else's life? Yeah, I, I've known people. I've known people that quit smoking cigarettes, not because they thought it was a bad thing. Well, I can get into the, to that this morning, but they quit smoking because they were more concerned because they thought someone else was would be hindered because of it. Well, they weren't concerned about themselves. They were concerned about somebody else. We can't be like Cain. We can't be like Cain. And when, when the Lord asks, "Where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper?" Let me tell you, friends, you are your brother's keeper. It's your responsibility every day for those people that are around you. It's not about you. It's about everybody that's around you. That's what matters. We've got to do the things that build up. We've got to do the things that are edify. We've got to do the things that are constructive. Verse 25, 26, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord and everything in it. You folks want any water? Come up here and get it if you like. Paul's saying don't run away from life. <laughs> That's what we do a lot of times. He said don't, don't run away from life. Live right out in the midst of it, friends. Live right where you're at. You don't have to go live in a cave. You don't, you don't have to start a monastery. You don't have to start your own little church and the only people that you associate is other little righteous people like yourself. Gracious sakes. Do not avoid trying to just be normal. Natural people enjoying the normal, natural life around us. Don't always try to overexamine every circumstance that arises. Look, God knows your heart. We're overexamining everything that we do, everything we say. We've got we to work it out. Man, I've got to work all this out. I got to, God knows your heart. Do the right thing. Relax. He's provided this beautiful world for you and I to enjoy. Oh, man. Don't be miserable in it. Don't be afraid to do anything in it. Live life to the fullest. Didn't Jesus say, I came to bring you joy? Then smile once in a while. But what about when you're invited to some non-Christian's house? That's what Paul gets into next. Verse 27. If, if some unbeliever invites you to a meal and, and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. What if somebody that's unsaved invites you to their house and you're going, oh no. Oh no. Some sinner has invited me to their house. I don't know how to make an excuse because I can't be associating with that kind of people, right? I'm, I'm, I'm so tickled Paul puts this in here. And, and, and it indicates where we are to live our Christian lives, right out in the midst of the world, right out where everybody can see us, not hiding under some bushel basket, but right where everybody in the whole world can look at us, they can examine us, and they can see us for what we are. And you're not going to be examined sitting in here all the time. You'll be examined when you get out there. Verse 
it's clear that separation to Christ does not mean isolation from non-Christian. Our, our fellowship is to be with Christ, but our friendship is to be with other people around. Amen? <laughs> Christians who refuse to do that are only deceiving themselves. They're, they are disobeying the command to the Lord to go forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Wow. He must really love us. We are to go and to, and we are to enjoy ourselves without asking questions. Paul said, if somebody asks you to go you know, and, and, now, and, now, and, and eat or whatever it is that, that you do there, do it. But nobody's going to ask you, you know, if, if to be uptight and, and to be self-righteous or to be legalistic. They're, they're not going to ask you to go, rather, if that's the type of person you are. So if you're worried about having to hang out with sinners, if you're worried about not having to do those things, just, just be a prude. Okay, just be self-righteous. Act like you're better than everybody else. And I guarantee you, nobody's going to invite you to the house. Probably not myself either. But when you care about other people, and you see that people are vulnerable and they're living in a difficult world and a difficult situation, they'll invite you to their house. Because they're going to see something in you. They're going to see something that's in you that can make a difference in their lives. Go and enjoy it. But be careful and remember your basic commitment is to Christ. Nothing need compromise that, friends, okay? Don't, don't walk out of here and get wrong on that. Don't compromise your faith. Verse 28 and 29 says, But if anyone says to you, This has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you, uh, and for conscience sakes, and the other man's conscience, I mean not yours. For why should I, my freedom, be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced? Because of something I thank God for. Now, that seems almost contradictory, and I don't want you leaving thinking that it is. You've got to judge for yourself whether you should go and do certain things because there are going to be other people that are going to be weaker and that may be tempted when you do certain things. You be careful of all that. You be careful of all those things. If somebody invites you or you go to some event or some place, you know there's going to be other people that's, that's weaker, than, and so you have to be careful in the decisions that you make concerning that. You, you, you Listen, and you also know what, how you stand. You know the temptations that you have in your life. You know the things that you deal with, and there's certain places that you know you don't need to be. Don't tempt that. Don't go there. But if that weaker brother would be harmed, it's not appropriate. Don't participate in that activity. But listen, at this at the same time, at the same time, realize that there are those that are only interested in finding fault in everything that you do. They, they want to find something wrong in everything that goes on in the planet, right? There are people like that that you'll never please. I don't care what you do. Ignore them. Go on and do the things because it's not their conscience that you're concerned with, okay? Don't let them rule your life is what Paul is saying. Don't let these people rule your life. And you know who they are. Set them straight. Go on about your business. Verse 31, 33, and then verse 1. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in, the, in every way. For I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. What a wonderful man this Apostle Paul was. You know, the, the effect that that he has had on so many lives throughout all these centuries is amazing. I wonder, I wonder when I think of this and consider this, what kind of effect that you and I may have on the centuries to come after us through our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, the legacy that, that follows after us. Paul wanted to win the lost, friends. That was it. He wanted to win the lost. He, he couldn't imagine heaven without his friends there with him. And you know who his friends were? People that weren't saved. His friends were the people that weren't saved. He couldn't imagine being to heaven without them. He had even said in some places that if it were permissible, that he would be willing to go to hell so that, so that those, his brothers and sisters, could go and be with the Lord. Wow. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that kind of love? He said he has the highest of motives, whether, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God so that, so that God is pleased. That's what matters, so that God is pleased. Don't worry about what everybody else may think. Is God pleased? And do it in this way for his reasons. That's the thing that you and I should aim for. The practical guideline is do not 
deliberately offend anybody. Not deliberately. Now, you can't help sometimes because, because you have to be faithful to Christ. And the most especially in the world we live in today, you're going to offend some people by believing the things that you believe. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. You don't compromise. You don't compromise what the Word says. Love people. Be patient with people. In conclusion, two favorite words that, that we have in church today. In conclusion. You know, I love, I love to read these beautiful stories. And, and I, you know, in the lessons that I get from God's Word, I, I just love to hear from, from people like Paul that explains all these things that the Holy Spirit helps to guide us in understanding of what this, what this Word means. But what I really like is to see this powerful biblical lesson played out in real people's lives. You know what I mean? Lisa, I, I mean, pe- people, like, people like you and I that are, that are actually living out their lives in such a way that they become a w- living and walking representation of this Bible. Isn't that beautiful when you think about it? Christy Humphrey invited me to a graduation ceremony Thursday night you know, for, um, for a group of people that had completed a uh, foster training course so they become foster parents. Six weeks cor- uh, course, I believe it was, wasn't it, Christy? Six weeks, two nights a week, three hours a night. Wow. Man, Kevin and April Tudor, they were the graduates this past time. Are they, are they here? I don't see you. Okay. And Kevin, there you are. God bless you guys. Um, Kevin, he's a character. I, I bless him. He won a couple of awards there. You know, uh, he was the one, and, and for those of you that need a volunteer, he's the one who won the award the most likely to volunteer. So don't forget that. Uh, Mary, where are you at? Don't forget that. He's um, certainly be interested in Bible school, I'm sure. And, oh, Bobby. Uh, and, and he also won the class clown award. So uh, I don't know about that boy. You know, Christy said that uh, the, the percentage of the people that she places uh, children into homes is the highest in our church than any other organization that she deals with. I, I want to just, I know, I know probably not all here, but if you're a foster parent or ever been a foster parent, see, I see a foster mom right now with a baby in her arms. How about stand up? How about just stand up for a minute, please? I don't want to make you embarrassed. Kevin, April, stand up. You guys stand up. Amen. God bless. Amen. Thank you. you know, I, I, look at, I look at these people that have made a commitment to foster a child, and, and I'm just amazed. Uh, you're showing the world that it's better to give than to receive. <laughs> not, not, not just reading it, okay? You're showing the world that it's better to give to receive. You're, 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 uh, you're saying that you should love your neighbor more than yourself. I, I mean, this, this is, is this not what the scripture says? When, when people see this in our lives, is it not more valuable than anything that we may preach or teach? I feel so insignificant sometimes standing in here. When I see the life played out in each of you, doing the things that the word teaches us to do, making a difference in the world we live in. I learned so much that night, Christy. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just so thankful. And I talked to Kim about it a lot. Kim has worked with social services for years, too, and she knew these things. But, you know, I, just, I guess I just saw it firsthand, and it just, just did something to me. You know, uh, in, in the ceremony, there was a panel of people that were up front, and, uh, you know, they, they, they consisted of, you know, people that were giving advice to these new foster parents, you know, as far as what to do, what to expect, some, some resources that you may have, you know, going through this process. And, and listening to all of this, I was thinking, why would anybody want to do this? Hmm. And there was a there was a lady there. Uh, she was a guardian ad litem. Is that the right term for it? She was there, and and she was also a foster mother. And uh, her daughter now was 18 years old. She had fostered since she was a baby. And um, she was uh, said her daughter was 18 and was now curious about to find about find out who her birth mother was, which is understandable, understandable. And this woman said that she was going to be there to, to help her seek out her mother if that's what she wanted. She'd, she'd help her. She said she'd be there and if, if, if she was happy and, and, was, and had a joyous reunion with her, she said, I'd be there to support her. She said if, if, she, if it was a disappointing reunion and she met her, she said, I'll be there to help her through her sorrow. The thing that she said that I just couldn't get out of my head, she said, that girl belongs to me. That girl is mine. She is my child. And I want her to know that she belongs to me. 
She doesn't belong to anybody else. No matter what else has happened in her life, no matter how disappointed she may be or how happy she may be in any situation, she said, that girl is mine. And she's mine alone, she says. I was so moved by that, Christy. I have thought about it all week. And here we are, friends. You and I are adopted children. <laughs> you're, you're, we've, we've, got a, we've got a Father in Heaven who adopted each of us. Just like you were, with all the baggage and the problems that you've got to bring, He's loved you through it all. Now, I don't know where you are today. I don't know if you're trying to find out some things about who you are or you're experimenting some, with some things in your life. But you need to know this, friends, that you belong to Him. You belong to Him. I don't care where you go, what you do, what you think, how you act. You, if you are a believer, you belong to Him. You are His son. You are His daughter. You've been bought with a price, friends. And no matter what you do, where you go, you are His. You will always be His. I say just let your life bring glory to God this morning. Know that and let your life bring glory to God. Let everything that you say and do reflect the majesty of Jesus Christ. Let your light not only shine but become a beacon so bright that people cannot get away from it. Let us not be a stumbling block. Let us be a blessing. Let us be a builder. Let us be an encouragement unto the world. And I speak to sensible people this morning. Amen. Judge this for yourself. Let's pray. Our Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this word. Though sometimes difficult to hear, I pray, God, that we would chew on it, understand it, and let it make sense in our lives, and let it make a difference to the world that's around us because of who we belong to. I pray, Lord, we are sensible people, and that we can hear this, and we can believe it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.